boards. We're going to start our recording. So, um, well, first, before we get to that, I want to launch our polls. So, we're going to do a poll right now, just kind of see where everybody's at and gauge how everybody's is with clutter. So it's three questions. The first one is where are you at now with clutter? Second is what is your favorite way to find freedom from clutter, which you can select as many as you want. And then lastly, would you ever declutter sentimental items and get rid of them? So we're gonna take about a minute to see everybody's responses. You have two votes out of 10. So got about 10 more seconds to get your vote in. Okay, so I'm gonna end the poll. And we're gonna share results here. So where are we all at with clutter? Um, so we have one person that's you know very cluttered everywhere. Um, I mean about an even split where between um, almost everywhere is cluttered and it's livable. Um, and then for question number two, what is your favorite way to find freedom from clutter? We had um, not everybody that replied, they wanted to donate it, which is great. Um, a few people sell it, a few people trash it, and then one for putting it outside with the free sign and one for other. So if you said other, tell me in the chat what it is, how you find freedom from other in another way. And then lastly, would you declutter sentimental items and get rid of them? And we had um, almost an even split between yes and no. We had five for yes and four for no. So kind of a interesting little split there. So sharing. So um, now we're going to do a little exercise. So you can close your eyes if you want and just imagine walking into an extremely cluttered, disorganized, and dusty room. And so you enter that room, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? So you can either put it in the chat or uh, come off mute and uh, answer any of these questions. The second question is, where are you, where are you picturing? Your house? <laughs> is it somebody else's house? Um, and lastly, what are the emotions that you feel when picturing a cluttered, dusty room? So, Laurie, I'm picking on you first, my volunteer. So, uh, <laughs> the first thing that comes to mind when I picture myself walking into a cluttered, disorganized room is uh, lots and lots of books. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, so I we have I'm sitting in the back room of the library and we have a lot, a lot, a lot of donated books and it's just they're just everywhere. Uh, so that's that's what immediately springs to mind when I think of um, cluttered and disorganized. Um, so that's also where I picture myself or or kind of at my father in law's house, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, the emotions that it makes me feel it's just, uh, I have to say, a little overwhelmed, a little stressed out. So that's that's what I would, how I would go with that. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. If anybody else wants to share, feel free. I guess I can share. Okay. Um, I'm trying to help my mother-in-law declutter her house and her basement. So when I walk in there, it's like, the first thing that comes to my mind is, what a mess. <laughs> and then 
I find it difficult because I understand why she wants to keep, well, some of the things, why she wants to keep them. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the question is, what's the best way to help her declutter? For myself, I'm middle of the road. I should get rid of more. I'm good at hiding it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's um, one organizer called the clutter bug and she has this test. Um, it's a quiz online. Laurie, I don't know if you could Google this for me. Um, clutter bug, what's your clutter personality quiz? But um, that's one of the personalities I think is, I think that's a butterfly, I want to say. But um, she has different little personalities that are, you know, one of them hides everything. One likes to see everything. <laughs> so that would be fun um, little quiz to take. It always is. So, yeah, I mean, it's negative emotions and, and overwhelm and, and what a mess. So that's, Steph, thank you so much for sharing. Um, Clutterbug, ladybug hides. Bees are visuals. We got somebody that likes the clutterbugs. So <laughs> that's great. Thank you. Laurie has put that into the chat, the link for that little quiz. If you want to take it later, or you can probably send it out in the email. So, what does it mean to be free from clutter? So, um, for me, it means saving a lot of time finding stuff that I lost. <laughs> um, I think there's a statistic where the average person looks for things that they lost for almost an hour a day. Um, and that is really true for me, especially because I'm always losing either my glasses or my wallet or my this or my that. So having less things allows me to save time because I'm not looking through as much to find what I've lost. So I don't, not perfect. None of us are. Um, and, you know, to be truly free from clutter is very difficult, um, but it's doable. So it's all about what is the right amount of things that you're using that are useful um, that you can maintain on your own. We all know how clutter can affect different physical parts of us. Um, so for me, like when I, I read those questions uh, and I thought about the clutter room, I got a stomach person. So there's physical effects, um, you know, emotional effects. And the physical effects, are, like I said, getting problems, you know, you can't find stuff. Your clutter can attract dust and moisture and become, you know, biological positive. Also, like I said, attracting insects, rodents. Um, if you don't, if you can't see everything, you're never going to know what's back in the corner. Um, and a lot of times, when we're organizing, we find lots of dead bugs. <laughs> so, less um, stuff means it's easier to clean and get back there, and um, you're not creating as much hazard for yourself. And for emotional effects, uh, like I said, you know, we all kind of especially women tend to experience a higher level of stress related to the amount of things in the home. Um, because this is uh, something I learned from another concierge because women have diffuse awareness. So when we walk into a room, we see everything in the whole room. Whereas um, typically men, they only like, you know, they only focus on like one thing and they don't really notice it as much. And also, you know, it's very distracting for me personally, if my dining room table is cluttered, I'm totally distracted <laughs> from anything else until it's, it's cleared off. I can't really focus. And every time I look over there, I feel negative emotion. Um, can create feelings of being trapped. So I have a, a friend who she told me she has a reoccurring nightmare where she has to move like, you know, almost immediately. And her whole house is filled with stuff. Whole basement is filled. And so she honest, you know, she gets nightmares about clutter, which is really scary. Um, and then also an organ a disorganized space can lead to a disorganized mind. And one thing, um, you know, for, I know that you, one of us asked about decluttering for other people 
And honestly, that's very difficult. If, unless the person wants to declutter and wants to get organized, it's, it's going to be an uphill battle. Like I had a, um, some, a potential client who's a friend from networking and she called me and was very distraught because her mother was hoarding, having some hoarding behaviors and she wanted to pay me to organize for her mother. Um, but, you know, I said, if she doesn't want to, it's going to cost a lot more money than if, if she's actively doing it with me, she's engaged, she wants to, to clean her space up. Just because, you know, we feel a lot of um, loss of control. If somebody else comes in into our space and they want to tell us what to do and get rid of stuff, then that's very, very alarming for a lot of people. And also, it's, um, there's some generational difficulties to overcome with this because when we, um, a lot of our parents, or my, my parents in particular, and their parents, they grew up like either during the Great Depression or right afterwards. And so they were taught that, you know, overnight they could experience like a great upheaval, you know, um, financially. And they were taught that they needed to keep things in order for them to be useful. Like, you know, that old rope over there, if, um, it might be clutter, but if you needed rope and, you know, you had some, then that was good for you because you didn't have to go out and buy it. So that's definitely a big thing with the older generation is that you, they are still in that mentality of, you know, I need to hold on to everything or else I won't be okay. I won't be safe without my, my clutter. So that's definitely a problem. Um, and also, one thing that I always recommend if you have a family member that you're trying to help is that you have to set the example for them. So you definitely, um, you mentioned this, you know, you have to do better yourself in order to help your family member do better. And that is absolutely true. Um, you're going to have to go through your own stuff and, you know, show them that you're also getting rid of stuff and you know, that it's okay and everybody does it. <laughs> because this is one thing that um, the famous organizer Marie Kondo has said in her books is that you um, you have to, to go through your own stuff first and get rid of it first because you can't expect them to do something that you're not doing. And it almost always rubs off on them. So if you um, you want somebody else to get organized, you kind of have to go through all your own stuff and get rid of it yourself. So that was, and that really did work for me personally. <laughs> My husband, he was holding on to a lot of his um, uh, boxes from his old home where you know he had grown up, and it was just you know just a lot of you know old comic books. I don't know what it was. Just it was just everything and anything but nothing that was useful that we had in our home it was all in the garage and in the shed, which that was all we had for storage. So I um, started reading Marie Kondo um, probably about five or six years ago because I had a lot of stuff coming into my life from my parents' house and it was starting to become extremely overwhelming because we only were living in 750 square feet. <laughs> so we were doing the whole tiny house and um, so they can get really cluttered, especially with no closets and no shelving. So long story short is that I went through all my own stuff in the whole Marie Kondo fashion, which is um, you go through your clothes, then your papers, then your books, then your miscellaneous. And lastly, you go through sentimental items and get rid of some. And she says, you know, once in a lifetime, decluttering that you go all out and get rid of as much as you can and then you know you'll be able to maintain it better going forward so I did that um and I made you know I took a lot of pictures <laughs> to, and I made a big you know big piles of all my clothes and big piles of everything on a shelf and I eventually got rid of a lot and we moved into a larger home so we had a little bit more space 
And through that process, my husband, he also decided it was time to get rid of a bunch of his stuff. And he got rid of almost everything in the whole shed. So pretty good. <laughs> so I'm a believer um, when it comes to, you know, going through your own stuff and focusing on that before you, you try to, um, you know, get other people to declutter. And like, uh, personally, my dad, you know, he, he also likes, you know, has a lot of stuff too in different places. And so, um, for him, you know, I know that if I try to control him and try to force him to get rid of stuff, you know, cause he doesn't have the space, it's just, it's not going to work and it's just going to cause arguments. So when he's ready to get rid of his things, he comes to me and, you know, or he'll ask me, um, my opinion about how to do this or that, get rid of it and I'll give it to him. But you really have to um, be very patient. And I, I do have a blog about decluttering and organizing for your friends and family, which you could definitely check out. Um, so we'll put that link in the, probably in the email. So where were we? So yeah, it's a, and it's a lot about changing your mindset. So um, one of the things that Marie Kondo asks is, does it spark joy? <laughs> um, but other things that you can ask to kind of, you know, decide on whether it's clutter or whether it's serving you is, um, you know, will I need this again? Uh, how does it make me feel? Like if you pick something up and it just makes you feel guilty or sad or angry, it's a good sign to get rid of it. Um, why am I keeping this? <laughs> and if you can't come up, up with a good reason, then probably time to get rid of it. And am I afraid to get rid of this and why? So you really have to um, be honest with yourself about these things. And it's going to be difficult, <laughs> especially at first. You know, once you start, you know, getting rid of stuff and you get some momentum. Um, and you start to see areas of your home that are no longer covered with stuff, then you'll start to feel better and it'll give you um, like the jazz to move on. And you, so you start to like build up a snowball, but at first it is very difficult. But being free from clutter means that you're happier, you're more productive, um, you can be more creative and Another thing that Marie Kondo also says in her famous book is that when you declutter and you make this space in your home, new opportunities will oftentimes come or big changes will come in your life. You know, so maybe you are really stuck in your marriage and, you know, through decluttering, you realize that, you know, it really was time for a divorce or separation. You know, that's one example. Or she's had another example of, um, people that started a brand new career after doing all their decluttering. And that certainly is true for me because I started my business and now I do decluttering for other people. So um, it kind of just, you know, it's out with the old and in with the new. So if you're feeling really stuck, um, it's a good way to kind of like get that loose and, and start making changes and progress and and that will oftentimes carry over into other areas of your life sometimes you have to declutter your friend list you know sometimes <laughs> if somebody is on on your friend list and they are constantly negative and you know they're they're making you sad or angry every time you see their post then it might be time to either unfollow them or defriend them um you know so it can, it can apply to people too so now we'll talk a little bit about the best ways to get rid of clutter. So I think um, a really good way to get rid of a bunch of clutter all at the same time is to have a yard sale and as long as it's allowable. So um, in order to have a really successful yard sale, you should definitely advertise on local groups, um, Craigslist, Nextdoor, um, some, uh, she, Veronica mentioned um, Nextdoor when she was talking about other, so she, she put stuff on Nextdoor. Um, you can also advertise in the newspaper. So that is important because there are people who um, on the weekends, they love to go to yard sales. So 
they look in the newspaper for the yard sales. And if you're doing a yard sale, you've got to put it in the newspaper, whatever. And it's usually only like, I think it was like 20 or $30 when we put our yard sale in the newspaper. Um, but that will take, you know, that definitely gives you a more, re a better reach. And these people that love to go to yard sales, they go early because they want to get the best stuff and the best deals. So try to, you know, get there early, get set up by nine o'clock at least. Um, price items to sell quickly and go for quantity. Um, it's, you know, the point is to, to declutter this for this yard sale. Like, you know, hopefully you don't need to, you don't need all the money like desperately. So you don't have to hold out for the highest price. Um, but if you are willing to, to let things go for a good price, you can really get rid of a lot, especially furniture. Um, because furniture is very expensive to like haul away. So for us, we have a couch that broke and nobody will even come pick it up. <laughs> so we're going to probably have to pay a hundred dollars to get rid of it. So it's, um, that's really frustrating, but if you can sell it for 20 bucks and that saves you a hundred dollars, you made kind of made an $80 profit there. So just saying. Also, you have to contact the municipal office to make sure that it's okay to have a yard sale, um, that you don't need like a permit. Uh, some, like in Quaker Town, I know my friend, she needed a permit to have a yard sale. Uh, we here in Emmaus, I believe we have certain days that we're allowed to have yard sales. And um, the other days, I don't know if we're even allowed or if we need to get a permit, but make sure you're, you know, on the up and up. You don't want the cops showing up to your yard sale for sure and shutting you down. And around here, at least, most yard sales are Saturday and Sunday. Um, different people come on different days, and that gives you enough time to really get rid of, you know, the most amount of stuff. And I would definitely suggest cleaning up your items, like just do the bare minimum cleaning. You know, if like you have a set of plates and they're very dusty, that's not exactly attractive to your potential buyers. So um, just at least dust them off and you know, make sure they, they don't have any obvious stains. Um, you know, you want things to be appealing to, your, to people that would like to buy them. So just do, at least do the bare minimum. So, um, and if anybody else has any other tips for yard sales, I would love to see them in the chat or you can certainly come off mute and let me know have any other tips for uh, planning a successful yard sale. So many people here, you guys are all so quiet. <laughs> I know some everybody's on mute, so I appreciate that with no background noise, but feel free to, um, you know, comment. It's supposed to be interactive. Do we have anybody in the chat? I don't see anybody. Plenty of singles to make change. That's definitely a good point. Uh, Donna, thank you. Make sure you have singles um, to make change. And also make sure that you, your home is not um, accessible to the potential buyers. So like sometimes like I've heard, um, you know, people going through the garage door or something like you have to be sure that your, you know, your house is locked and, and secure so that you don't have any security risks with people just wandering in. Maybe they think that there's some more stuff in the house, but um, definitely gotta be, keep in mind for safety, especially when you're inviting the public to your home, you don't know who they are. So another way that we can um, kind of find some freedom for clutter from clutter is by making scrapbooks. So I'm a big fan of scrapbooking. I have been since I was like probably 12, um, I don't know. We, we used to have a scrapbooking store in Doylestown where I lived and they held classes and they had the coolest stuff and it was right in the middle of town and it was really trendy for a while. So I was there a lot and I had a lot of fun like learning, um, you know, about matting photos and, and what adhesives to use and, and collecting all the supplies. <laughs> Um, which is also a big source of clutter, crafting supplies. 
So you gotta be kind of, you gotta limit yourself there. Um, but scrapbooks are a great way to get rid of not only photos, but also, you know, like little, um, like different little paper items. Like when I did my scrapbook on my trip to Brazil, I included a bunch of the little like wrappers from my food that I saved. <laughs> So a lot of them I was able to get rid of when I, when I was making the scrapbook, I was like, okay, most of this, this wrappers are going right in the trash, but there was a few that I was able to incorporate because they had some really fun, um, like a lot of it was ham flavored, like snacks, which was weird, but <laughs> so, um, you can get rid of that type of stuff by scrapbooking, but scrapbooks actually don't just have to be from paper, from physical photos. You can save a lot of time and actually make your scrapbooks duplicatable by um, creating a digital scrapbook. And so there's, um, we're gonna be talking more about this during September's class on photo organizing. But um, the first step is obviously to get your photos digitized. And uh, here at View Concierge is now offering scanning services for photos and documents. So I'm gonna be helping clients with that type of work. And so once you have them digital, you're able to back them up in different locations, um, either on two different uh, external hard drives or on different memory sticks. So that in case um, something happens to one of the, you know, one of the sticks or one of the external hard drives, you still have a copy because digital files are, are very vulnerable compared to physical files. So you need to make sure they're backed up um, in at least two or three places. And you can always keep your physical photos as like an extra backup, but you wanna store them in archival storage boxes, which are acid free. And then once you have the um, digital copies, you can make them into really nice gifts, um, canvas wraps, like, uh, you could do a puzzle, a coffee mug, um, you could do a giant blanket. You can pretty much do anything under the sun with your photos for gifts once you have them digitized. And, um, you know, while you're making your scrapbooks, it's always fun to like text a picture to, you know, somebody like, you know, if it's me, it's my best friend, I'll text a picture to her and show her, um, you know, the picture that I uncovered or, um, you know, family member. So you can kind of make it fun and reminisce while you're doing the actual scrapbooks. And if, of course, if you have any scrapbooking tips or, you know, photo tips, please put them in the chat. Um, so next thing we're gonna talk about is giving away and donating items. So, for items that you can just throw in your car and transport, you can just easily take them to Goodwill, the Salvation Army, uh, other thrift stores that are accepting donations. But make sure that the items are in good usable condition. Uh, we had Goodwill locally, they recently put out an article saying that because of the pandemic and like the great decluttering rush, uh, they're receiving a lot of items that are not in usable condition, things that are broken or, you know, stained beyond repair, stuff like that. And they just, um, you know, they wanted people to, to just know that that costs them money to dispose of and that doesn't benefit their, their causes. So make sure things are in good usable condition if you're going to donate them. And if it's something like too large to transport, so probably like a furniture item, you can try using uh, freecycle.org, which uh, we found out about from Habitat for Humanity. Um, or you can also use Habitat, they'll pick up um, furniture items, and, you know, you have to send them a photo in advance, but then they can sometimes pick things up for you. Um, there are items that are considered hazardous. So a lot of times my clients will have old paints, either latex paints in like the cans or, you know, spray paint. So make sure that you're aware, um, you know, of how to dispose of these things properly. You know, you can find lots of information right on Google, 
but if it's something like chemicals, um, you might have to take it to a special location or with like with the paint cans, they often tell you to just open them up and dry out the paint. We have a, um, a local resource for the Lehigh Valley. Thank you, Donna. Look, it's called WM at your door. So that's, I guess, waste management. So they'll, um, perfect. So they'll come and pick up stuff, which is great. So I'm probably going to have to, I'm going to write that one down because like I said, we still have got to get rid of a couch. <laughs> it's like amazing how difficult it, it has actually been. Um, so that's great. So that's waste management, but um, you'd also use a service like, you know, 1-800 Got Junk or College Hunks um, or a moving company. A lot of times they'll pick something up for you and take it to the dump, um, you know, but you do have to pay for those services. So you can get rid of it for free. It's great. And Donna says that waste management will arrange for bulk pickup if you need for the large couch. They just like to know that it will be, there will be a large item at the curb. Yeah, so out here in Emmaus, we have white, white, white tail. I think it's called white tail disposal. And so I did go on the, um, she, she's in Larimer country. So that's a different town. Uh, so that's great resource for that area. Um, but yeah, I think that white tail disposal will pick it up, but I have to pay a hundred dollars. So. <laughs> trying to avoid that but today I was like this is taking so much time that I will just pay the hundred dollars at this point because I do not want to keep going on and on about this couch so that's freedom from clutter right you know sometimes you just got to pay and get rid of it and it's money well spent if, if you know if you have a huge couch and it's taking up half your living room and you could use that space for much more productive uses than just you know Get rid of it however you can if you, if you have to pay. So a huge, huge, huge source of, pay, of clutter for a lot of clients that I have is mail and paper. And I, um, re, I've done multiple like two to three hour organizing sessions that only focused on paper and mail. And I have one actually coming up I think at the end of the week, yeah, I'm going to go and just deal with paper for a business owner <laughs> because it is so pervasive. Um, so my biggest tip is going to be just to try to reduce the amount of mail that's actually coming into your house. Or if you're a business, you know, reduce the amount of things that you're actually needing to print. Um, that can, you know, I had one boss a long time ago, she would print out every single email that she received. And her desk um, was an L-shaped desk and it was covered with three feet of paper on every side so that you could barely see her. <laughs> so um, don't print out emails if you can. So um, also Donna is, is telling us if you, if the company you buy the couch room will haul away the old. Oh, she said that sometimes if you're buying a new couch the company will take the old one away, which is very smart. Cause that, that's actually a principle one in one out. <laughs> so, and then back to paper, um, you have to a lot of times shred paper on a regular basis. Personally, I have a trash can for trash and a trash can for shredding because I generate a lot of um, paper and I will always wanna make sure that I'm destroying information. So. I take my shredding to Staples and I pay by the pound because I have so much. I do have a shredder, but like most people, my shredder does not work very well. <laughs> and so it does not um, hold up to the amount of abuse that I, I have. So I take my shredding to Staples. And if you're gonna buy a shredder that you want to like hold up, um, you're probably gonna spend at least $50 if not 75 or 100 um, to get one that is, you know, big enough and that will do all the paper that you generate. Um, so, oh, another way to reduce the amount of mail coming in is to, um, this has to deal specifically with credit card offers, which, you know, sometimes you get one or two a month, sometimes you get like six a month. And they're required by law to include a phone number 
on the credit card offer that allows you to opt out of credit card offers. Um, so if you go on the back and you read the fine print and find where it says opt out, you can call and I believe you're calling like one of the credit bureaus or something and they will take you and opt you out of all the offers for a specific amount of time. So I don't get any off credit card offers in the mail anymore. So that's less to shred <laughs> and um, a lot less paper clutter. Another way to reduce the amount of incoming mail is to um, choose, like if you're somebody who donates to charities, like I am, you, you wanna choose a few select amount of charities and make larger donations to them. So um, for example, I had one client who he would make small donations to many different charities and like, honestly, I think he, he would receive 50 to 100 requests for charity money every single month, it seemed. So what happens is that they, um, a lot of the charities make extra money by selling their list to other charities. So once you start getting on all these different lists and then you start getting your information sold to other charities, it just, it multiplies and, and sometimes mushrooms out of control. Like, um, this is true for some of my family members where they just receive, you know, charity requests every single day, sometimes multiple per day, and it's just too much. So um, try to choose like two or three and just make larger donations to them, um, you know, so that you don't have that much mail coming in. So, um, and if anybody else has any tips for reducing their incoming mail, we would love to see them in the chat or any other tips about anything that we talked about so far. And of course, like I said, reducing printing by saving your documents in a portable format. So in PDF format, um, instead of printing everything, you can keep things on your hard drive or if you use Google Drive or Dropbox, keep things there, but just, you know, have them have them available to search, but but you don't necessarily have them printed out. So that way um, it will save you time because if you have to find one of those documents, it's so much easier to search in Google Drive than it is to search your physical items. <laughs> Tracy Gill has a um, tip. She says, switch to e-billing. Yes, absolutely. I did that and um, only got like one or two physical bills in the mail anymore. So, so nice. And then Colleen says, use direct debits from your bank accounts to pay bills. Exactly. Yeah, bills. That's a huge one. Um, I didn't even think of that. So thank you guys. And one of my um, clients for paper organizing is, I told him he needs to invest into a filing cabinet um, that has four drawers, a vertical one with hanging folders. So right now he's using the um, file, like plastic file boxes, and they are taking up a lot of like floor space in different spots of the room. So I told him, you know, invest into a four drawer filing cabinet vertical, or even a, a horizontal, you know, as long as it'll fit everything and use hanging folders. And that way you won't have to, um, open four different boxes and can have everything in the same system. And in case you're wondering, I recommend using a straight alphabetical filing system. So um, with big categories. So if you're doing your personal, your big categories would be um, auto or car, whichever one you would search for, you know, insurance, home, uh, utilities, you know, so those are your big categories. And then within those, you can have separate manila folders for, you know, like, let's say you had one for gas and one for water, you know, so that's this filing system I recommend. Um, oh, so Veronica gave a great tip. She said that we need to declutter our automatic payments. So that's an example of decluttering um, kind of in a way that we wouldn't normally think of. Uh, but that's also important if you're trying to get rid of debt is to go through all the automatic withdrawals 
make sure you're using all of those products or those softwares and cancel the ones that you're not using any longer. So for me, I was using uh, stamps.com for a long time because you can get like reduced rate postage and you can print it right out in your printer and it's label paper, which I love labels. So I had fun with it um, and bought all the stamp paper, but it's $5 a month. And after not using it for such a long time, I just canceled it. And I'm gonna try to sell the paper to somebody who else, somebody who is um, signing up for stamps.com. So you know anybody who needs that stamp paper, let me know. So those are my tips on decluttering your paper and your mail. Oh, and one other thing before we move on is that I use um, a binder system for um, things that I have to refer to frequently. So I, I get a lot of uh, different documents that I have to keep and refer to. So I'll use a binder system and I um, will always invest in the dividers for what I need. So if I'm filing, like for example, receipts using a binder system, I would get the January through December binder dividers. Um, if you're doing different people's um, paperwork, you could use a straight alphabetical binder divider that goes A to Z. Um, or if you have a different, like if you have a training binder, um, you could use one through seven or one through 12. So those um, are usually always available at the office supply store in case you're wondering, but that, binder system does help me a lot if it's if it's just for reference i'll file it but if it's something that has to be used frequently i will put it into a binder with um sometimes with protectors but not always i always keep my three hole punch like right on my arm's length so that i can put things in binders because once you start generating like piles they just like multiply you know so um, if you have piles, it's, it, you know, you got to take the time to get rid of them and you can't let them accumulate. Um, so it's best to try to deal with them right away. So last but not least, we're going to talk a little bit about dealing with your sentimental items. Everybody's favorite. So there she is. There's Marie Kondo, the, um, you know, goddess of organizing. She's so cute. I love her little outfits. <laughs> And so she's the best. Um, so one way that you can kind of, you know, deal with sentimental items is by um, using like a shadow box or like a, um, like a, a treasure box, we call them. So a shadow box, you can kind of use your creativity. If you're not creative, you can maybe enlist a friend to help you who is creative or, you know, sometimes I'll help clients with stuff like that. Um, but it definitely takes, you know, a couple hours to do a shadow box and you want to get all your stuff together. So for me, I did one that was um, on my wedding. And so I took like the strips of fabric that had got cut off the bottom of my dress for alterations. And I took um, the pen that we use to sign our, our wedding license and put my um, invitation in there and like all the little seals and, and little labels that I printed and um, put them all into a shadow box kind of like with different like dimensions and it looks really great. Um, and I was able to get rid of the rest of the stuff that didn't fit in there and just feel good about it. So I look at it all the time. But you would also do um, like kind of like a either like a shoe box or um, like a, you know, archival type box and have that be your memory box and whatever will fit inside is what you keep for memory stuff and whatever doesn't fit it you have permission to get rid of it so that's a little bit more um drastic but definitely that the way that the reason that works is because you're giving yourself a limit of space and you're saying this is how much space i'm going to devote to all the sentimental stuff and everything else is is out of here, you know? And depending on how much space you have in your home, you know, you can have a larger or smaller box, um, but that, that gives you, you like a, 
you know, gives you a visual reference, like this is how much stuff I'm gonna keep. So let me know in the in the comments if anybody has a box like that or a shadow box that they've done, what subject you've done it on. And also, you know, you can create digital photo albums. So um, maybe instead of keeping everything, you know, keeping it in a box or however, keeping it in the basement, you will go through and take pictures of each item that, and then you can create a little photo album out of that, those pictures. And that way your stuff takes up a lot less space and you can have permission to get rid of the actual physical thing, but you still have the memory and you can even write a little caption write a little paragraph about what this thing was, why it was so sentimental to you and why it was so important. And the beauty of that is that you can even create multiple copies of that. So like, let's say you are a grandparent and you wanted to pass all these things down to your children or grandchildren, but they don't have the space for them, you know, or they don't care enough to keep them all. You can do a little book you know, with pictures of everything and really explain to them the memories behind the items. And that way everybody wins. You get to pass on your legacy, they get to receive it and nobody has to physically hold on to all this stuff. So that's a little bit more radical, but um, I know that 50% of us would declutter or get rid of their sentimental items. So. For those five of you that said yes to my last question, there's your, your little secret. Yeah, and you can also, you know, pass on certain items to others. Um, and I recommend doing this with your smaller items. So we talked a little bit about generational differences. Um, and so right now there's a big generational difference between the millennials who want to be very minimalist, we are living in smaller spaces than um, our parents and grandparents. We have, uh, you know, maybe we have a larger debt from student loans and we need to have those smaller spaces. So we can't take on all this um, old stuff. So millennials, they tend to like, you know, clean white furniture from Ikea and not the beautiful um, cherry China cabinet that filled up the whole room that was beloved. So um, what's happening is that there's a flood on the market of all the items that the baby boomers and their parents um, are trying to pass on so desperately, but are not being accepted by their kids or grandkids. So um, you have to kind of keep that in mind. You know, maybe you'll be able to get rid of a few things by passing them on, but most things people are not going to want, especially if they're larger or if they're more like formal, like a good example is that the family China is most people are trying to get rid of their family China passed on to their kids, but they're finding that the kids don't really care about family China. They're more casual at the holidays or maybe they wanna buy their own set of dishes. Um, so that's kind of an example or like, um, you know, real formal champagne glasses or glasses for every different drink. Uh, that's gonna be hard to, to pass down. But if you have, you know, family with, with a lot of space, maybe they'll take it. So it's always worth asking. So let us know in the comments if you um, have ever been able to pass things on or, or maybe if you tried and, and got rejected and how that felt to you. I'd love to get some more comments. Yes, yeah, so um, pretty much thank you all for coming tonight and participating and um, your comments have been all really great. And I, uh, you can definitely follow me under my Instagram, under here for you concierge, Facebook under here for you concierge or um, request me on LinkedIn under Melissa Draving. And then here's my contact information, my website, um, where you'll find my blog for more great information. And yeah, so does anybody have any questions? We have about five or 10 minutes to go through questions. 
I need to drink. <laughs> Melissa, um, I'm wondering, uh, do you find that scrapbooking leads to more clutter because of the materials coming in to do scrapbooking or scrapbooking solves the problem because people are fashioning loose papers into junk journals, altered books and stuff or both at once or what? Yeah, and definitely anytime you have craft materials, they do take up a lot of space, um, but whether they're clutter or not, it depends on whether you're actually using them. So you kind of have to um, first be realistic with yourself and decide, you know, am I the kind of person that starts a crafting project and finishes it, you know, in two months or three months, or am I gonna, the kind of person that's going to procrastinate, put that off, never finish? you know, maybe, um, so it's kind of deciding that first and then deciding how much space you're gonna allow craft items to take up. So maybe you have like, um, for me, I, I have a uh, Michael's brand uh, little cabinet that's the right size for scrapbook paper. And I used to have my scrapbook paper in there, but I lent it to somebody who hasn't given it back yet, but, um, it does take up a lot of room. You have scrapbooking, paper, all the views. So that's why I definitely think that um, digital scrapbooking is is more beneficial to get, getting, you know, to not taking up space. So if you have all your photos digitized and you can easily create these albums online, like um, I had a client uh, two years ago who had me come to her home and we uh, took her vacation photos and we created a photo album for her and one for her friend whose birthday was coming up, who she had gone on the vacation with. So that can be done in almost like, you know, one afternoon or, or over two afternoons once you get the photos scanned in, in digital format. Um, and then you can print as many as you want. You know, that's the cool thing about the digital scrapbooks is that you um, have the ability to print more than one and you can send them to everybody who went on the trip and they don't take up that much room. But if, if you really like the physical stuff, you wanna keep the physical stuff, you know, scrapbooking physically is fine. Just have to kind of give yourself a limit of how much space your stuff's gonna take up before you go out and buy it. Does that help? Uh, set yourself a limit. That's it. Yeah, I'm still writing here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. It's clutter if you don't use it. That's that's true. Yeah. I met a, a lady yesterday in junk journaling class who had three craft rooms in her house. Three. If you got a big house and that's what you love to do and that's how you spend all your time, then that's fine. But if you don't have that space to devote to it and you still have three rooms worth of stuff in the basement and it's all, you know, getting ruined because, you know, after, because if it's not in the main part of the house, um, a lot of times like the papers can warp if they're, you know, not in the right moisture area or like, you know, maybe like with photos, especially they say that you should keep them in the main part of the house because they can get stuck together or, um, you know, mice can get in there and you wouldn't know right away. So it all kind of depends on your own situation, whether it's useful or whether it's, it's clutter and you should get rid of it. And that, that's one thing that you can kind of gauge by like listening to the feelings in your body. So if it's, um, you know, if you go and look at your, your stuff and, and you feel like in your stomach, you feel stress and, and you know, your palms start sweating, then you should probably get rid of it. But you go in there and you're super happy and you love it and, you know, it's all Pinterest perfect, then keep it. Good point about listening to your body. I like that. 
Thank you. We have any more questions? We usually have so many. <laughs> because um, I have a question. How do you work with people virtually? On organizing or? Yes. Um, I personally, I don't have, I don't usually do virtual organizing, but what I do for people virtually is more um, towards the personal assistance side. So uh, for example, I have, a lot of my clients are business owners. So today I spoke with one of my clients who actually lives in Baltimore and she and I discussed um, her recruiting for a new position um, and we discussed how we're going to post it. We created a project plan about this project that she has coming up. Um, another client I had, she was, um, she has airline tickets that uh, because of the coronavirus she wasn't able to use yet. So she asked me to go ahead and call the airline on her behalf and try to get her, um, you know, a voucher or whatever. Uh, another, other things that I do virtually. Um, sometimes I type documents for people or create spreadsheets or convert spreadsheets into CSV files. Um, so mostly it's a lot of stuff for business owners. But there are organizers that do a lot of virtual work. So they mostly do it over Zoom. And my understanding is that they, you know, you Zoom with them and show them that your cluttered areas. And then um, as you kind of do the organizing, they help, uh, they help you create a plan. They help you decide what to do with the stuff. And they also help you with follow-up. So, like I, when I worked with an organizer here at my house, she will always send an email afterwards about all the things I said I was going to do with the stuff. <laughs> and then she'll follow up with me, like, you know, make sure I, I did it all by the next session. So, but um, also like a lot of the digital organizing that I do is um, with files. So if uh, let's say a client has, um, either photo files or uh, different documents, we can do a Zoom session and go through them and, and figure out the best organizing system for their files and um, you know make the right folders so it's easier for them to find things later on. And um, another one last thing that I do virtually is I'll do technology coaching. So that's usually always over Zoom and I'll do a um, Zoom call with somebody. And like, let's say they're, they're, they have a big presentation coming up on Zoom. We'll go through the whole presentation and practice it. They'll practice um, screen sharing, unscreen sharing. Um, I, one time I taught somebody how to run breakout rooms on Zoom for a big meeting. So um, that type of thing. Or, you know, if they're having a, they need help learning how to use their computer better. So Laurie had to run, but um, I'll stay for another five minutes. So if anybody else has any final questions, feel free to ask them. Or if anybody has any other comments or you know, wants to share at all, go for it. Oh, I remember now. Okay. I, I, I haven't learned all the uh, Cassandra Arson's um, clutter bug system yet, but I'm watching the show. Oh yeah, she has a show but, now. But the, the, the way that um, you remember ladybug is because you ever see, a ladybug and it has the nice red wings and everything, but when it opens itself up, or you can see underneath and it's horrible. <laughs> and that's what a ladybug is. They, they have the outer is all put away, but you look in the drawers and you look under the doors and it's all horrible. 
that's a great way to remember it. <laughs> that's the only way I remembered it. Yeah. So it works. The rest might have tricks too, but I haven't, I don't know yet. Yeah. Um, she's great. She does a lot of YouTube videos that I really like. Um, and the show, if somebody wants to know what show it's, uh, uh, I think it's hot mess house. Oh yeah. Um, we have the, the quiz here, but I don't think so. Is that on Netflix? Hot mess house on home and garden television. Well, I'm in Canada. She's probably, she's Canadian. So it's probably free for us here. <laughs> okay, great. So there's so many on the market. Who Who's the best? Like Fly Lady, okay. Peter Walsh, the one that you Leeds, Martha Stewart. <laughs> well, not really her. She doesn't really declutter, does she? Well, it's all individual. So like you have to kind of look around and see which one you like best and which works best for you. And so my tip is to just take the best and leave the rest. <laughs> so you're always gonna, um, you know, if you're like me, you always wanna learn and, and see the different styles of organizing and see, um, you know, how they, they kind of do it and differentiate themselves. But whatever works for you is the best. And it's gonna be different from what works for me. Cause like we, we both took this little quiz and probably got different answers. Um, it's gonna be different what works in one person's home versus another's. Or like what resonates with one person is just gonna be completely different than what resonates for somebody else. So. Did you end up, um, what was I gonna ask you? Something about, um, did you find any uh, of the KonMari method uh, to be culturally strange? Um, me personally, uh, we like, we love Jap, we live um, manga and all the um, anime in this house, we're anime house. So for me, I kind of like, I guess maybe watching all the anime kind of prepared me a little bit, but I was just speaking with my friend, uh, Danielle McKay, who has also started an organizing business. And she said that she did think that culturally it was really weird. And she, you know, um, she kind of had a different opinion. So I thought it was, I don't know, I just kind of thought, had an open mind about it. But um, the one thing that we did talk about was uh, she likes to organize um, from the left, like, left starting at the left and going down and in i told her that in marie kondo's book you start at the left and go up and it's like the stock market going up and danielle was like well i always think of it the way i read is left to right and so she was like do they read right to left and i said yes so she, she thought that was interesting that they that she read that marie kondo reads right to left but um so that's how she organizes, whereas Danielle obviously reads left to right. And so that's how she likes to organize things on a shelf. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, it's, it's a little caveat. Um, so, and somebody asked about um, where they can find out about more of the events. And I have all my events are on my website, um, which is hereforupa.com slash events. And Kelly, actually my assistant, will be adding the newest event, which is um, the one on photo organizing. So let me get that information for you. Let me see if we have it on Eventbrite. Um, that's gonna be a really fun presentation. I just uh, actually got certified to become a photo manager. So that'll be my first little presentation on photo management. Um, we talked about it a little bit tonight, but we'll go more in depth about organizing physical photos during that one. It's not on Eventbrite yet, so let me get off my email. What made you think to give this presentation? Um, finding freedom from clutter? Yes. Well, it's supposed to be like July 4th is like, you know, the month for freedom, right? And 
we do a lot of organizing for clients. So I wanted to do something with freedom and organizing. Yeah. The idea. Okay, so our presentation on printed photo organizing is going to be on September 27th. So I will send out um, a follow up email to everybody that uh, registered who I have emails for, and I'll make sure that we include that um, presentation information. It's going to be called printed photo organizing. And that is going to be at the library, but um, I, just, I think Laurie said it's okay if we do a hybrid, so we'll also be streaming it. Okay. okay, well, everybody, thank you so much for coming tonight and spending this hour with me and learning more about um, decluttering. And feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or, you know, have any comments or want to know more about anything I talked about. And um, definitely hope everybody has a great night and we'll hopefully see you guys at the next one, which is in August and it's gonna be on um, how to delegate successfully. And then in September, we'll see you for photo organizing. So have a great night, everybody. I'll see you later. Thanks, Melissa. Have a good night. Welcome, bye-bye.